live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Good evening. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover, and we are coming to you not from our studio tonight, but from our homes, and we are so thankful that you're joining us. We are excited to have on the show tonight Jennifer Carol Foy. Jennifer Carol Foy is a graduate of VMI. She was the third class of female cadets. She also is a public defender and in 2017 was elected to represent Virginia's second district. Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Of course, thank you for having me, Lindsay. I really appreciate you inviting me and I appreciate being here. Well, let's get right to it. I know that um, you are in your home, I am in my home because of the social distancing and the, the COVID-19 that we're all facing right now. Can you talk a little bit about how this has really affected Virginia? What does it look like for us here in the Commonwealth? Absolutely. So COVID-19 has affected every aspect of our lives and no one um, in our lifetime has ever experienced anything quite like this. And so it's affecting uh, businesses and people's health and lives and welfare, um, the economy and things in ways that we never thought possible. And we're working very diligently and it's, it's difficult. It's, it's a very complex dance of when it's safe to reopen, um, how, how long do you continue the shelter in place in order to protect people? Um, but then you have business and the economy that's, that's really taken a turn. Are we gonna be able to come back from this? Um, I really do believe that our economic environment will look nothing like it did pre-pandemic. Our lives, I mean, it will completely be changed. There will be a new normal for all of us, something that we'll all have to get used to and transition to. So um, COVID-19 has been absolutely exceptional um, and the effect and impacts it's had on us so far. But I can tell you that there's so many people who are willing to step up to the challenge, um, who sees this as a puzzle piece and we just have to figure it out and who are bold and ambitious and a lot of the policies and things that they're taking on. And I'm really excited uh, to get continue to get to work. That's great. Now, you talked a little bit about Virginia starting to reopen. Um, you know, our viewers are from all over Virginia. Can you talk a little bit about what reopening looks like for us here in the Commonwealth? Yes, yeah, so, so far, um, we, as of May 15th, we are open in Virginia, our phase one. Um, so we're open, but with some limitations, um, such as 50 percent capacity in some areas, uh, so being encouraged to wear a mask, um, to shelter in place is still a really good thing to do because um, we're not completely out of danger. Um, we don't have a vaccine yet, so we have to make evidence-based decisions and listen to the experts. And so that's something that I also pride myself on is taking the politics out of this because you'll get pressure from both sides. So it's really about making science and data-driven decisions. And what it's telling us now is until we have the 14-day decrease, um, until we have the widespread testing and contact tracing and all of those things, then it's really best for us to slow walk this. So you do have some people concerned because areas of Northern Virginia, Richmond, and Accomack County have not opened yet. Um, and we won't open until another two weeks. And it's really because our numbers weren't where they should be. So while I understand people's concerns about I can't open up a business and will I be able to come back from this? But I want to remind people, while there's a bottom line we have to worry about, we also have to worry about our front line. And that's our frontline workers, the people who are jeopardizing their lives every day so the rest of us can remain safe. Um, that's what's paramount. And as a legislator um, and hopefully the future governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, my job is to protect people and public safety is number one. And I have to ensure that we're making the right decisions at the right time to protect the most people so we successfully make it out of this. Absolutely, and you've been so thoughtful in your plans for how we should tackle this. And I, I've even heard you say, you know, Band-Aids aren't good enough, right? Our going back to normal isn't good enough. Can you talk a little bit, as you, I know, are doing so many Zoom calls a day, connecting with Virginians all over the state, 
Can you tell us a little bit about what you're hearing from families right now? So I'm hearing from families that they are scared, they are anxious, um, and they're worried. They have received their last paycheck and they don't know when their next one is coming. That they don't know if their job is really going to hire them back. And when I talk to a lot of businesses, that's, that can be a reality. Because now businesses know that they can operate in a way that's different than before. So they can work on a skeletal crew. Um, that they can actually have more employees to telework. And so everyone being connected to jobs right after this uh, pandemic subsides is not inevitable. So we have to gear up on workforce development and job skills training and ways to connect people back to maybe even different skill set and a different employ employment after this. And so that's what I'm really hearing. Um, and what I would like to say to those people is that your fear, your anxiety is well founded. I see you and I hear you and I understand what you're going through and we are all in this together. So I have the same concerns when I have to go pick up groceries and whether or not, um, you know, someone was at a cough or was at a sneeze when someone walked past me. And if I go home, you know, am I going to take whatever I have back to my two year old twins? I mean, these are concerns that we all have. And so it's really about us being patient. It's really about us uh, having good leadership, who is transparent, who is listening to the science and the experts who are making responsible decisions. And we just have to stand fast because we have examples of a lot of other states doing things that's very reckless and people are paying their lives for it. We're not gonna do that here in Virginia. And so that's why I am confident that we're gonna make, get out of this better than we were before. That's fantastic. Now talk a little bit about what you're hearing from small business owners, because when we talk about the economics of how this has affected the Commonwealth and even our country, it has really hit small business in a way that many people weren't prepared for. Can you talk a little bit about what you're hearing from small businesses and also what type of relief is available for them at this moment? So when I talk to businesses and small businesses, what I'm hearing is, Jen, no one is talking to us. So we have people telling us what we need and what we want, but wouldn't it be more prudent to go directly to the source? And so that's why I've established a Rebuilding Virginia Economic Council, because I'm doing just that. So I'm going to um, economic and business leaders across the Commonwealth in multiple different industries and asking them, what will best suit your needs? What do you need in order to you know, jumpstart your business to help us jumpstart the economy and get you connected back to the workforce. Those are the questions that I'm asking. And so I'm getting policy suggestions and recommendations that I hope uh, to translate into actual budget amendments and to bills um, this coming summer special session, because that's how passionate um, and determined I am to ensure that we successfully make it out of this and we jumpstart our economy and that businesses are heard and they are seen. You see what happens when you don't talk to the source. You have the federal government, for example, having, you know, the uh, paycheck protection program and having the um, economic injury loan. Um, and you have all of these things that they had good intentions um, and it had full on support, but no one was talking to the people on the ground. And that's why 95% of that money didn't go to the people who needed the most. That's because no one thought about the logistics. Well, if we make, you know, banks, the decision makers, I mean, what should we tell them? What, what, you know, regulations are we giving them? What directions are we giving them? And so that's why some banks took it upon themselves to say, hey, barbershop, or, you know, hey, food truck worker, you don't bank with us. So therefore, we're not going to service you or approve your application. And that's why we're going to cater and pander to our larger um, patrons who bring in, you know, millions and millions of dollars because we want to make them happy. And so that's what happens. We don't talk to the people on the ground and you don't think about logistics. Um, those type of errors are made. And I'm hoping that we avoid those type of instances here in Virginia. That's good. I know when we saw the paytech Paycheck Protection Program. Mm -hmm. I mean, never was it more evident about the importance of having a personal relationship, if you will, with you know who you bank with. Mm -hmm. um, so much of banking, especially for small businesses, is done online, and we saw how important it now is to get to know the people that are behind um, your banking needs. That's right. 
Mm -hmm. Well, talk a little bit about nonprofits. Um, you know, I know it's been hard for nonprofits right now to really survive in many cases. And we've, we've talked about the small businesses, but can you touch a little bit on how this has affected nonprofits throughout the Commonwealth as well? Yes, yeah, so there are some nonprofits, well, majority of the nonprofits who are really hurting um, because they rely on people's disposable income for contributions. And so people have really readjusted their budgets to where that disposable income is now going to, um, you know, a savings or, go, or being directed to other things. And so it's really dried up a lot of the money that nonprofits needed in order to function, to pay uh, salaries, in order to uh, complete whatever their missions are. And so they are bearing a lot of the brunt of COVID-19 and they serve some of the most important functions. They filled in the void of connecting people with services and um, helping to feed a lot of individuals and help the homeless and foster children and to make, you know, take up a lot of that, that slack that the state and federal government lacks. And so it's, it's hurting a lot of people and a lot of people are languishing because of that. And so it really is gonna take some ingenuity to figure out, even though we have revenue loss um, and we don't know how big of a hole COVID-19 has blown in our budget, what can we attribute to some of these nonprofits who are indispensable, who, is, who are serving such an important function in our everyday lives and, and to, for the people in our communities that we have to prop them up, we have to help them and service them and have some money directed to them immediately. And for people that are needing services that so many of the nonprofits provide right now, is there a place they can go either at the state or the local county level where they can still get the assistance that they may need? Yes, so a lot of your local governments are trying to pick up the slack um, as far as your community services boards, um, as far as your Department of Social Services, your Virginia Employment Commission, your D Virginia Department of Health. I mean, they are all implementing committees that's looking into ways to be more proactive, to help more people in the community that are really needing services that otherwise nonprofits would have taken care of. So that's that's what's happening. So it's really about reaching out. You can reach out to your legislators um, and ask, this is what I need and, and how can you get me connected? Who should I be reaching out to? And all of us will be more than happy to do that, whether it's your um, county board of supervisor member, your school board member, your delegate, your state senator, or your congresswoman or man. Um, that's, that's our function, that's what we're here for. And so if you just reach out and let us know what your need is, we can definitely get you connected to where we can service you and where you need to be. That's great. Well, that's a great segue into a recap of the legislative session that I'm sure seems like a lifetime ago yes. at this point. But can you talk a little bit about some of the big accomplishments that came out of session um, here just a few months ago? Absolutely. So I'm really proud of what we were able to get accomplished this last legislative session. It was historic. I had friends who grew up in Virginia and left to go to other states and who would call me and say, I don't even recognize this Virginia anymore. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. And so it's something that I'm so proud of um, to see all of this bold and progressive and ambitious legislation um, that we were able to pass to help so many. So um, one of the greatest accomplishments was uh, easier and better access to the ballot, which I'm really excited about, uh, making election day a state holiday, because that was in essence a poll tax of people having to decide, can I lose two, three hours of pay in order to go vote? Um, also, um, same day voter registration here in Virginia, that's a game changer. We're Huge. Feeling huge repealing a uh, voter um, mandatory voter ID uh, you can register to vote at the DMV through automatic voter registration um, and removing uh, no uh, removing excuses in order to vote absentee so we now have no excuse absentee voting here in Virginia and that is phenomenal and so having all of these things in place um, is a total game changer here in Virginia, because we want people to have more access to the ballot while protecting our elections um, by and also promoting more people to participate in our democracy. And so I think we've successfully done that here in Virginia. The one thing I would say because of COVID-19, um, I'm really championing vote by mail right now. 
And so we don't want to be Wisconsin. We don't want people to choose between their lives and their safety and safety of their families and their constitutional right to vote. So I am urging um, the General Assembly to pass um, a bill that allows for every single registered voter to get a ballot in the mail while also keeping polling locations open because we do have people who are homeless. We do have people who um, may have language barriers and eligibility issues or data errors and those things can only be remedied at a polling location. And also because we have same day voter registration, you can only do that if we keep polling locations open. So I'm really, really pushing and championing that here in Virginia and hope we can get that done. Um, some of the other things we did was uh, improving Virginia as a commonwealth for workers. We're number one for businesses, but we were 51st uh, for workers and working families, and that is abysmal. So passing legislation to end pregnancy discrimination and in wage theft here in Virginia, where people were stealing from the state by not paying, paying you know, payroll taxes and unemployment insurance and um, actually stealing from their employees um, and increasing the minimum wage is a huge game changer. Because let me be clear, no one should be working 40 hours a week, making $7.25 an hour, bringing home around $14,000 a year. I mean, in Northern Virginia, it is unconscionable. So fighting and championing that issue, because we'll talk all day long about how so many Virginians are now being called what they've always been, essential, but when they look at their paycheck, it says that they're expendable. It says that they're disposable. So respect has to come in the form of a paycheck by what people can put on the, on the table. And we do that by increasing the minimum wage. So I was excited to, uh, to put that bill in and to support um, Delegate Jawan Ward, um, who have been championing this issue for a very long time, whose bill's passed. Um, and so I think that was phenomenal and a huge win for Virginia. And then of course, it was a big year for equity. Um, Virginia, we passed the, uh, the Values Act here, making Virginia the first Southern state um, to have anti-LGBTQ discrimination in employment and accommodation, which is huge. Um, also for dreamers to get in-state tuition, undocumented immigrants to have driver's licenses. Um, I chief co-patron the Crown Act um, that says you cannot discriminate against a person because of what naturally grows out of their scalp. Um, carry the pregnancy discrimination bill so that women, when they're seven months pregnant and they ask to have a seat because they're suffering from morning sickness, cannot be fired at discretion. And that was something that we allowed to happen here in Virginia. So all of these bills that we passed um, were just amazing and a big push forward for diversity and inclusion here in Virginia. So I'm just really excited for all of these things that I champion and all of these things that I supported. That's phenomenal. It gives me goosebumps just to hear mm -hmm. you talk about it. And mm -hmm. two, just to know that some of these things were in place previously. Uh, mm -hmm. that we had a state that discriminated the way we did previously. And I think that speaks so much to all of your hard work and, again, how much elections matter, right? When we are able to vote and elect leaders that really care for Virginians, it, it just matters. So thank you for all of your hard work because it is such an exciting uh, session that you all had, and we are so grateful, all of us, uh, for all of your hard work on that. Of course. It was my pleasure. Absolute pleasure. <laughs> Enjoyed well, every minute. <laughs> it's exciting. It is. And you talked a little bit uh, about possibly being able to vote by mail. Tell us about that process. And I know it's something you're really pushing for right now, but what would the process be to be able to have that done? And how can our viewers get involved and help you champion that issue to ensure that everyone can vote in a safe way? Yes, thank you for adding that. Um, so everyone can get involved um, by leaning on your legislators and contacting um, your legislator and letting them know that you want us to have a vote by mail system here for our November elections. And so we're going to have a special session um, at the end of the summer, probably in August. So that will be a great time for us to get this um, 
done, officially passed, we can do a legwork now. So I've asked the governor to um, direct the Department of Elections to do a feasibility study so we can know how much it'll cost and how to keep our elections safe. And we can actually start preparing for vote by mail now. Um, even though we have our, the, the vote will be in August, which is kind of late, it's still better than nothing. Um, if, if we are really going to say that every vote matters and we want to protect our democracy and um, the election process, then vote by mail is the best way to do it. So elevating the conversation, writing op-eds, landing in on your legislators, um, actually circulating this on social media because there's so many other states who are moving to this system and, and states who've been doing it and doing it very well for decades. So it can be done. Um, this is something that's pivotal, but time is of the essence. And so we have to move on this as quickly as possible. And it, every day we lose is another day that we could have made this even better, stronger system here in Virginia. And you're right. I mean, so many other states do it. Also, we know service members who are active duty uh, deployed have the opportunity to vote by mail. So this, there's a system in place that we can look to for best practices when we look to, to do this here in Virginia. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, we talked about all of these amazing things that happened. Is there something in particular you're most proud of that came out of the session? Hmm, maybe a little thing called the Equal Rights Act. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> so the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, I mean, Lindsay, I just cannot tell you. I remember vividly what it was like uh, going to uh, some members and saying, hey, I think we should really champion the Equal Rights Amendment and being told that it was a waste of time, that committees and committee chairs haven't changed, and that it was a dead issue. And so, you know, I always love to step up to a challenge. So tell me something I cannot do. Right. You work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that is when, um, along with VA Ratify, ERA, ERA Coalition, ERA Now, Equal Means Equal, um, League of Women Voters, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and all of these wonderful organizations and advocates came together and, you know, we did a bus tour throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia educating and energizing people about the ERA. And when I tell you that we took it from an issue that no one was talking about to making it one of the top issues in Virginia, the last election, that is exactly what happened. The equal rights of women and women's equality was on the ballot and people showed up in droves. And so you had presidential candidates talking about it like I've never heard in my lifetime. And I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. So very rarely do you get to do something as pivotal as that, to carry the resolution to make Virginia the 38th and final state needed to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment that says in two years, it automatically becomes a part of the United States Constitution. That is phenomenal. So I would have to say, my hat's off is to that effort um, to have women come to me and say, I've been fighting for this uh, since before your mother was alive. Wow. I mean, I know I stand on the shoulders of giants and people who have given their lives um, and blood, sweat, and tears for this issue. So to be able to do this was just a huge accomplishment. And I have to, of course, give a big shout out to one of my favorite people, Eileen Davis. So Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we, <all love> we <laughs> do. She's fantastic. Fantastic. Well, so it's interesting. So when you started to talk about the ERA, Mm -hmm. You had people actually tell you this issue wasn't worth your time. Democrat. 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 Yes. That this wasn't worth your time. Absolutely. And that was what, just two years ago? That's right. So two years ago, to see where you started mm -hmm. and where now we are, it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. I remember coming to one of your bus tour events and bringing my daughters and it was such a great opportunity to explain to them what the ERA was. And I got these two puzzled looks like, are you serious? And my eight-year-old says, 
it's 2019, mom. And you're, <laughs> a, yes, you're, you're having these conversations with your daughters and, mm -hmm. and realizing that, yes, it's about time. So thank you so much for your work on that. Yes, of course, of course. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about it because it was such an emotional and exciting thing when it passed. And for our viewers and those of us that weren't able to be in Richmond when the gavel went down and you realized we got this, tell us a little bit about what that felt like. Um, I was nervous until the votes were on the board because one thing to learn in the General Assembly is that anything can happen. So people will tell you, you they'll support a measure and they don't. Um, things can happen where just a random person, legislator can stand up and ask for it to be delayed or to be set aside or there's some type of defect in the bill. I mean, you just never know. So I stood on edge and I was anxious the entire time. I knew we had done the work. I knew we had had the conversations. Like I stood up on the floor and said, every single Republican and legislator in the General Assembly received a book of hundreds of pages to answer any type of question they could have potentially had. So, so to say that they didn't understand it or know about it, or they had issues um, about, you know, whether or not this would affect women and men's sports or, or women, will women be drafted, all of those things were concerned. But this was my hard and fast line. So I'll, I mean, I just know even going to different events and, you know, telling Republicans like, there's some things we can disagree on. Most of my bills I've passed in a bipartisan fashion. We can talk about transportation and education and funding all day long, but I can't negotiate on my equality. And if I can't change your mind about whether or not women are equal, then I promise you, I will change your seat. Mm -hmm. And that is a promise that I made. And I fought like hell to make sure that the very next election that we flipped as many seats as we needed in order to take the majority, raising $120,000, giving it to over 81 candidates, knocking on thousands of doors, doing events across the Commonwealth because it was that important. That's incredible, incredible. Mm -hmm. And I wanna talk a little bit about all of the incredible work you did because you worked really hard in particular to help women get elected. And I remember seeing you all over just helping so many women candidates from, you know, board of supervisors to school board to the House of Delegates. Uh, talk a little bit about the importance of women running for office and the important need to, to really work to protect um, our equality and our ability to elect more women at every level. Absolutely. So I am here to do the work. And so when I talk about ensuring that we have good Democrats across the Commonwealth so we can move the ball forward on our democratic values, and that's what I mean. And so I was backing uh, people who are running from school board to county board of supervisors to soul and water. It did not matter. Um, and I will always encourage as uh, an eMERGE alumna, women to run and women to run everywhere. And so that's something I'm very passionate about. And so I was willing to support and help them do the work because as these groups tell us, women are supported less and less often. So it's up to us to fill in that gap, to do the work to get these women where they should be. Jennifer, I want to continue on that. We're going to have to go to break here, but please stay with us. We will be right back with Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. <sighs> but now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome. We need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. 
You may have heard people talking about the April 1st United States Census and wonder what it's all about. The census is a count of everyone currently living in the country. It happens once every decade, and it's at the heart of how Fairfax County serves our residents. The census helps determine how much funding Fairfax County receives from the $675 billion that the federal government allocates each year to improve transportation, provide education, health care, affordable housing, and prepare for emergencies. For each resident who does not respond to the census, Fairfax County could lose $12,000 in potential funding over the next 10 years. Imagine if one family of four doesn't reply, or 10 families of four. The amount of lost resources for our community could really add up. The census helps Fairfax County decide where resources go based on where people live, including schools, roads, firehouses, police stations, and clinics. It establishes how many representatives we send to Richmond and Washington, D.C. to advocate for our community. You can have a big impact by completing the 2020 census. The U.S. Census Bureau will mail every household an invitation in March to complete a simple questionnaire about who lives at your address on April 1st. You can respond online, by phone, or by mail. The form will ask for names, age, sex, race, and the relation of everyone living in your household. To ensure a complete and accurate count, census takers visit residents who do not respond. Federal law keeps those responses safe, secure, and confidential. Your name and address cannot be shared with law enforcement, immigration enforcement, or any other government agency under any circumstance. The information is only used to create accurate statistics about the nation's people, places, and economy to help serve our community. In Fairfax County, we believe everyone counts, no matter how young, how old, or your immigration status. If you live here, we want you to be counted. Visit fairfaxcounty.gov topics census to learn more. And remember, in Fairfax County, everyone counts. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Lindsay Davis Stover. Continuing our conversation tonight, Delegate Jennifer Carefoy. Jennifer, right before we went to break, we were talking about the importance of electing women and how hard you worked to ensure that women were supported and elected at every single level. Can you talk about um, the importance, again, of just encouraging women to run for office? Absolutely. I think it's incumbent on all of us to ensure that not only do we have competent leaders and top talented leaders, but also those leaders are reflective of our communities. And so women are leading the charge. We're the majority of the workforce, majority in graduate programs. Uh, we are the backbones of our communities. And in a lot of instances, we are the breadwinners of our families. And so what I was seeing was a real lack of effort and time and attention being paid to the issues that's really affecting us and our families. And that's because our voices weren't represented. So it wasn't until you had that surge of women voted in 2017, did we really lean into the conversations of uh, paid family medical leave. And we actually started a you know, mom's caucus, right? And because we didn't have changing tables in the General Assembly and let's get organized child care because when we're on the floor for several hours into the to the wee hours of the night doing the people's business we have children that need to be breastfed or we have children that need to be cared for so that's what happens when you have a seat at the table the policies are being promoted that affect women and therefore affect families communities and the entire commonwealth so we were pushing for increasing the minimum wage and collective bargaining um, for firefighters and teachers and because we see the lack of resources in the classrooms and the uncertified teachers that licensed teachers um, that's there and we want to do something about it we know what it means to sit in traffic for two hours going two miles in the hampton roads area in northern virginia and we want it to end now because i can tell you this nothing that pains you really more than traveling to and from work, losing three hours out your day that you're not getting paid for, or calling a friend and you're sitting in traffic and they've already fed, cooked dinner, did their child's hair and they're getting ready for bed and you haven't even made it home yet. So those are the quality of life and kitchen table issues that weren't really being addressed. But when you have women at the table, they are. Statistics show that women, we are better negotiators, we compromise better, we bring more people to the table, 
we time manage and organize better. I mean, and I just think we're, you know, overall rock stars. It's just my opinion. You know, I think we do things just as good as men, but we do it better and in heels, right? And so we need to be in these positions. And so it's my goal to ensure our, I empower as many women as possible um, to run races and to be successful, to fill in the gaps, whether it's you know, fundraising or support or door knocking, it doesn't matter. You call and I will be there because that's what I believe. And that also includes the women who are running in Southwest Virginia, because I want to give a plug to them really quickly. I believe in the rural revolution. I believe in the effort that's the rural ground game and the rural, you know, movement that's happening out there. And a lot of those people who are running are women and they have been ignored, but they're putting themselves out there in difficult races. Some of them know they won't win, but it's all about moving the ball forward. But we have to support them. We have to show up for them. And we have to ensure that Democrats everywhere are, are visible. And when we do that, we continue to increase our numbers and increase our impact throughout the Commonwealth. So that is something I'm excited about. Campaigning is one of my favorite things to do and something I'm good at. So I'll continue to do it for all dynamic candidates, but I have a special, special place in my heart for women running everywhere. Well, I love how you brought up the rural communities. Um, as you know, I'm really involved in the rural communities here in Virginia. And, you know, I think over and over we hear again that rural candidates aren't supported in the ways that they need to be supported and i'm someone that believes that you know we should be competitive everywhere right and ensuring that not only everyone's represented in virginia but that we're able to talk about the issues in every single community can you talk a little bit more about how important it is to really invest in our rural communities, not only for the short term, but also for the long term. Absolutely. So you have communities in Southwest and rural Virginia that are solidly red, but every couple of years, you know, it is just becoming bluer and bluer and bluer and populations and demographics are changing. And we need to ensure that those people are being heard and their, their needs are being met. So one of my biggest challenges when I'm running for governor will be unifying the entire Commonwealth because there are sentiments of regionalism that's shared. And some places in South Side, um, you know, have certain feelings about Northern Virginia who may not care for Hampton Roads and, and, and then everyone has an opinion about Southwest, but we all rise together. And so it's really about unifying the entire Commonwealth and seeing that we all have the same basic needs. We all want our children to go to good and safe schools. We all want to work one job and be able to put food on the table. Um, everyone wants to have access to the middle class and the American dream. And it's really about honing in on that and meeting people where they are. So that is something that I'm really focused on. And you do that by going to those communities, not neglecting them, by showing up. It is as simple as showing up. When I go to some of these areas and when I'm in Shenandoah Valley and when I'm out there knocking doors and supporting those candidates and talking to the Democrats, I mean, they are so thankful and happy because you showed up and you listen to them. Everyone wants to be seen and they want to be heard. And once we do that, that's how we start this movement, movement and we continue it on and we start laying that foundation for candidates that come behind us so they can be even more successful. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, as you've traveled around the Commonwealth and, and helping to get candidates elected, I see that you've also filed to run for governor. What more can you tell us about that? Yes. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are filed uh, running for governor for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And it's something that I'm really excited about. Uh, because for, t for me, uh, the status quo just isn't working for too many Virginians. And people are struggling to pay for their health care costs, earn a decent paycheck, or just get ahead. And so there's been a lot of political promise that's, that's, been, that's been made, um, but there are communities that are still suffering, who's been neglected and left behind. And I see it when I go to Petersburg, to Pulaski, to Portsmouth. So what about those communities? The communities that's really suffering, the people who need a voice. And so I will be the candidate in this race who can look at every single voter and say, I see you. I see the obstacles that you face, 
because I faced the same challenges. Growing up in Petersburg, Virginia, being raised by my grandmother, I too had to sit at a dining room table after she had a stroke and became a quadriplegic and had to make the decision with my aunt whether we're gonna pay for our mortgage or for the medications keeping her alive. An impossible decision. And as a mother of twins, I don't want my children or anyone's children to have to make those type of decisions. So that's why I've dedicated my life to service. As a foster mom, as a public defender, and now as a delegate who stand up for people when no one else will. I want to ensure that there is no community that's left behind. And that is why I'm running for office. Because we need a leader that's right for this moment who understands the challenges that people are facing and have the common sense, fresh solutions to move Virginia forward. And that's why I'm excited for this race because we have an opportunity to change the face of democratic leadership, to change the policies and positions that we fight for, move in a bold new direction where everyone has a chance to thrive. And it is my job to ensure that Virginia's future is better than its past. So I'm really excited. Well, congratulations on filing. It is so exciting. And one of the things that I love about you most is when someone says no, you show them yes. And you, you proved that with the ERA. And, you know, you're proving that now with, you know, being able to reject the ways that we've always done things and looking to a future that's better so that when we do get back to normal, that we don't go back to where we are, but we actually move forward. And I, I love that about you. And I love that about your vision, because I think it's really what Virginians need and want to hear right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, tell us a little bit about, you know, if you're elected governor, mm -hmm. what will be your top priorities? Because you have been a champion on so many issues and you've laid out an incredible vision for the Commonwealth. Um, but if there are three, four top issues that you absolutely want to do as governor, what would those be? My number one priority is bringing diverse high paying jobs to the Commonwealth of Virginia. So people will be voting their pocketbooks from this election to the foreseeable future. Um, too many people have received their last paychecks and don't know when their next one is coming and businesses are hurting our economy is down and so it's my job to find solutions in order to jumpstart our economy and get us back to where we were and even better so my focus will be on my plan in order to bring jobs to virginia and to improve our economic um, opportunities throughout the commonwealth so that's number one also health care while I'm proud to have helped expand Medicaid to 400,000 Virginians so they can have access to quality, affordable health care, there are still so many Virginians who can't afford their premiums and prescription costs are still out of reach. So that is a challenge for me to ensure that people can get the prescriptions and the health care that they deserve, even while we have Medicaid. So it's improving Medicaid expansion here in Virginia. And of course, preparing our students for the 21st century global economy. So there's such a lacking in Virginia and our teachers and our schools and our administrators have done so much with so little. And in Virginia, we can do better. Our teachers are still paid $8,000 less than the national average. We still have so many English as a second language learner students who aren't being cared for. And we have children that have needs that aren't being provided because we have a teacher shortage in Virginia. So it's really about uplifting our education system, investing in capital improvements, building schools um, with modern technology, and really building the skill set for our students, for those who go to college and those who don't want to, by also improving our career and technical education here in Virginia. So it is my goal to be known as the public education governor. And I will do that by making the necessary investments to ensure that every child has a quality education. Well, that's fantastic. I, I know that education and healthcare um, are always a top of mind for families right now. And, and especially now, right? When, when the environment that we're in is causing us to think about healthcare in a different way. And as all of the parents out there watching 
this evening. It's, it's teaching us to, to think about education in a different way, as many of us are educating our children at home and participating in the distance learning. Can you talk a little bit more about the education piece? For the families watching tonight, and, and I know in our first segment we talked about Virginia reopening, um, but how do we reopen schools or continue to educate our students in this environment that does best prepare them for the future? Yeah, so COVID-19 has really shown us um, some glaring opportunities that we have in our educational system and in our structures. Because you have this disparity of even when you're trying to do online virtual learning, that there's some kids who can't afford a laptop or don't have a computer at home. And what's most glaring is the fact they don't even have access to internet and broadband. So how are they supposed to do homework? And so you can't um, have benefits for you know some and not all. And so it's really shown us where our opportunities are and how we can really move forward and move ahead. Because some jurisdictions have provided laptops to almost every student, while some barely have books. And so it's about making those necessary investments, not only in schools, but also at risk schools. Um, and seeing that schools with high, you know, reduced and free lunch, they need even more services and, and more money because we have a, a defunct you know, system here in Virginia where our schools are really funded by property taxes. And so that's what creates a lot of our segregation in our schools in the Commonwealth because families, when they look to buy a new home, they look for the schools first. And so the more property taxes communities pay, the usually typically the better the schools are. And so you have these affluent communities with good schools and then you have these lower socioeconomic communities without. And so that's really causing the divide. And so it's really about finding the formula to fix that and fixing the way that we fund schools here in Virginia, fixing the formula that we pay for paraprofessionals, bus drivers, um, janitorial services, all the people who service our kids who are, who are at school and make sure that they are also receiving the money that they deserve um, and having these systems that's in place. And so education on the other side of COVID-19 looks like us taking a look at what we can do better, ensuring that we expand broadband, of course, to rural in Southwest Virginia so we can eliminate a lot of those disparities, ensuring that we're preparing our students for the global 21st century economy by providing kids with laptops and so they can understand um, how to learn using what people you know, will soon be using exclusively, which is pretty much um, computers and electronics to be able to do their work. And, in order for us to get to where we need to be, I know that summer camps are going to be opening soon, but us also having uh, protocols in place to keep as many kids safe as possible because there is misinformation out there that kids don't, don't catch COVID-19 and that's just not true. They are carriers. They do suffer from uh, the virus. And so when we do these things, we have to do it in a safe way. But there's committees that the governor has, um, has uh, put together whose sole job, and Atif Carney, who's uh, the Secretary of Education, is doing a phenomenal job to ensuring that we have protocols in place to keep our kids safe when we do open schools, um, hopefully in the fall, if we don't have a second wave or a second surge. And they will determine what the protocols are in order to keep as many of our kids safe as possible. That's fantastic. Because um, as we do look for the future and look to prepare for the future, education is really at the top of mind for most every family in the Commonwealth. And to hear that it's also a part of your platform and your priority as you're thinking about the future is so encouraging because we are thinking about healthcare and education in particular in such a different way. And I do want to touch on healthcare so we have some time to be able to really dive in to healthcare. And, and I know it's an important issue as we you know, continue to move forward and protect our frontline workers. But can you talk a little bit about what you hope the future of healthcare looks like here in the Commonwealth? So the future of, of healthcare in Virginia hopefully looks like the most amount of people we can cover by um, by health insurance possible. That's exactly what happens. So. Medicare for all and programs like that, it's really a federal issue. It's nothing that we can do on the state level. Um, so my job as governor will be to improve 
uh, the Affordable Care Act to improve Medicaid um, that we have here now. And that's by uh, the reinsurance program, which has been proven in other states to actually bring down the cost of premiums because um, the government, uh, the Commonwealth, will be buying them down. So it's more affordable for more people. Um, also, the cost of prescriptions. One of the things I was most excited to support this last session was Delegate Lee Carter's bill in order to put a cap on insulin because we had people dying in our Commonwealth because they were rationing their insulin, which could, could have cost as much as $1,200 a month. And so in order to ensure that people can afford prescription costs, I'm finding innovative ways in order to drive down prices and make them more competitive. So people aren't filing for bankruptcy or cutting prescription pills in half just to get by. So that is incumbent upon me as governor um, and our legislators to find innovative ways to address these issues. But I do hope that one day we do have a system where every single person has access to um, safe and affordable and quality health care, because I do believe that it is a right and not just a privilege. Absolutely. Well, and I know campaigning for you has looked very different in the last few months. And even I'm sure connecting with your constituents um, has looked very different for you in the last few months. Can you talk a little bit about what campaigning looks like right now uh, during this time? Yes, so you have to put on your creative, innovative hat uh, <laughs> when you are campaigning in the midst of a global pandemic <laughs> in a crisis. <laughs> of this magnitude. And so I remember, um, you know, early on, it was just so many organizations uh, that we talked to and rely on. And we were asking, so like, what advice do you give? And they're just kind of like, we have no idea. And so um, just picking up some best practices from other people, I can tell you that constituent services have been the utmost important of importance for me and you know responding to as many people as I possibly can and get them connected and in, into the right agencies and answer their questions as needed especially around unemployment and um, and small business loans and all of those things so I have had an uh, influx of those type of uh, constituent questions that come in and we've been very good I've done a number of town halls and panels and roundtables and forums just educating people on uh, important information that's out there, whether it's um, minority communities and the impacts of COVID-19, um, unemployment, we've done several uh, town halls on that and educating people about that because we've upended the entire system here in Virginia because now uh, solo practitioners, um, independent contractors, gig workers, you know, self-employed people, they're all now covered where initially in Virginia, you would not be covered under the state unemployment insurance. So really just you know, giving out as much information as we possibly can that's important um, and advocating for the right thing and letting people know what we're advocating for, such as PPEs and masks for grocery workers and bus drivers um, and ensuring that, you know, we encourage people to get as much uh, sick days and um, hazard pay as, as they possibly can, especially our frontline workers who need it the most, who's jeopardizing their lives for the safety and wellness of, of the rest of us. So. That's what a lot of my time has been taking up doing, um, and I've been really busy with that. And then, you know, just right now, we don't know when we'll be able to knock on another door. So our doors have literally been translated to digital because we have to meet people where they are. And they're on social media, they're on their phones and sending mail. So right now, that's one of the best ways to communicate. Um, and it's just really interesting to see how a lot of these other campaigns will transition um, right now. I don't think the best thing to do is just wade in the water. You have to be proactive. You have to meet people where they are, provide them with the information and stay engaged. That's what's really important. And when this whole thing subsides, I look forward to traveling the entire Commonwealth and visiting every single county and hearing from every single community because what's most important to me is to be their voice in Richmond. Absolutely. Well, to get to some fun questions, how many Zoom calls have you done today? <laughs> <laughs> so I started at, my day started at nine, and this is my last one, which is, it's 8 p.m. now. So yeah, we've had a whole day full of Zooms and town halls. I did a virtual town hall with my congressman, uh, Jerry Conley, um, and just, just so many uh, 
conversations with different organizations and community groups um, about addressing the more immediate needs and of communities um, is, is really what we've been taking a lot of time on. So I would probably say I average maybe five to six a day. <laughs> That's impressive. That is impressive. Yes. Now, is there something that you have discovered or maybe rediscovered during this time, whether it's an old movie or a good book? What have you kind of discovered during this time? Yes, I have discovered um, that two-year-olds have 30-second attention spans, <laughs> um, that I could never be a teacher, and my hats, uh, they have my utmost respect. If someone puts in a bill to make all teachers make $100,000 a year, I would support that bill. <laughs> because absolutely, they need it. They deserve it. God bless them. I don't know how they do what they do, but... Um, they do it well and I just I don't understand so um, I have to say that I mean this this whole time really you know exposes a lot I mean I wish I had time to like read for enjoyment mm -hmm. um, but with everything that's going on there's always a new fire to be put out um, it's just very difficult to do that so we've been very very busy um, every moment of the day pushing good policies and um, talking to constituents and um, with organizing organizations at advocacy groups so that's really taken up a lot of our time but I mean this is what I really enjoy I do this for the people because I want to help and this is a great way to help them when they're most in need so it's it's good well that's great what advice do you have for families right now because I know you and I've talked about the struggles of juggling kids and school at home and work responsibilities and so many families are juggling those things and uh, different health issues, you know, things that, that come up. What advice do you have for families right now as, as we are all in this together? Absolutely. My advice would be, you know, to be patient and keep your eye on the ball. Um, there's this false narrative out there that if you are um, for keeping people safe and you're against the economy. And that's just not true. Um, we have to make evidence and science-based decisions and listen to the experts. You know, taking politics out of it and putting it to the side is the best thing that we can do right now because, because people's lives are actually in jeopardy and we have to keep that perspective. So what I would say is um, just be patient Know that you have leaders who are responsible and working diligently to protect you and ensure that we get out of this as successfully as we possibly can, even though that there has been a failure by the federal government, um, specifically uh, the president, and spreading misinformation and the lack of transparency and a lack of sense of urgency to deal with a lot of these things. Um, but that's where governors come in. And people have really seen how governors have been the backstop in protecting their commonwealth and their states. And so just know that we're going to get on the other side of this and we're gonna do it together. And when we emerge out of this crisis, we will be better and stronger because of it. So that's what I would say to everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Delegate Jennifer Carroll Foy, who has also filed to run for governor. I know you have a lot on your plate right now, so we are thankful that you joined us this evening. And to all of you out there watching, thank you for joining us as well. Be safe. We look forward to seeing you again. Good night.